In every cricket museum in the world, especially here at Lord's, there's a special place of honour for Sir Donald Bradman, captain of Australia, extraordinary cricketer, prolific run scorer, who in 80 test match innings averaged 99.94. But Sir Donald's life in cricket extended well beyond his playing days, and that I think is because he is a student of the game, still, as well as a professor. His book, The Art of Cricket, is a classic tutor, and by the way, has just been republished. Now, as an administrator with the Australian Cricket Board and the South Australian Cricket Association, he's worked tirelessly, always available to the players, but really he's devoted himself to his wife, his family, perhaps his golf. He's a single handicap golfer, and he's always shunned the media, a very private man. And it's that privacy which has surrounded him with a considerable mystique. Walter Robbins, once a familiar figure here at Lord's as Middlesex captain, knew Don Bradman well and said of him, no one I can think of has equaled him as a player, as a thinker, or as a citizen. He is an astonishing man. Well, recently, Sir Donald decided that it was time to put on record some of the thoughts on his long life in cricket. At last, after all this time, he decided to confront the cameras. Your Excellencies, for Lords and gentlemen, a pray silence for Mr. G. G. Bradman. In the 1930s and 40s, Don Bradman was a national hero. The boy from the bush who became famous around the world through his genius for cricket. His average in test was 99.94. The measure of his class is that of the world's great batsmen, no one other than Bradman has averaged more than 61 in test cricket. Aged 81 when this interview was filmed. He agreed to the interview because it is to accompany a collection of cricket film which is being made for the Bradman Museum in Barrow, where he grew up. Sir Donald, what are your first memories of cricket? Oh, well, my first memories, I suppose, are when I was going to the Barrow High School and playing with the other little kids in the playground with a, the, the bell post as a wicket and things like that. We, we had really no organised cricket in those days. We just played around amongst ourselves. In the early 1930s, Bradman reenacted for the camera his boyhood practice routines, hitting a golf ball with a cricket stump against the side of a corrugated iron tank and catching practice with the aid of a paling fence. In retrospect, it was significant, but of course at the time when I was doing it, it had no meaning at all for me other than the fact that I was just enjoying myself. It never entered my head that I was probably training my eyesight and my and coordinating my movements that didn't that didn't register at all in those days. Now, of course, I can uh, realise what the significance of it was. Don Bradman was 16 when he took the game up in earnest, and it wasn't long before his performances in the local competition caught the attention of the New South Wales Cricket Association. Don came down from Barrel in 1926 to the Sydney Cricket Ground in practice nets. When he came down from Barrel, he impressed everybody by his superb confidence. And the selectors were equally impressed because they picked him within 12 months to go down to Adelaide and Melbourne. He scored a century in his first appearance at uh, Adelaide. It was a remarkable performance. And what do you think, in 12 months' time, he had the distinction and the honour of playing as a youngster, 18, a mere youth, in the first test match for Australia at Brisbane in November 1928. That's obviously a shot of the exhibition ground where the uh, test match was played in 28 9. That's uh, Ponsford and Woodfield going out to bat for Australia. Oh, a splendid shot of Morris Tate. Notice how after he delivers the ball, he hitches his uh, tie up around his waist. He was LBW to Morris Tate for 18 in his first test innings. Australia collapsed in the second innings. Their total was 66. Bradman made only one. Bradman was 12th man in the second test, 
but he returned to the 11 and made his first test century in the third game of the series. Australia lost the first four tests of that 1928-29 series. They finally recorded a win in the fifth test, played in Melbourne. With scores of 123 and 37 not out in Melbourne, it was becoming clear that Bradman was a batsman of world class. His average for the series was 66.86. Here, he's facing the English fast bowler Harold Larwood, of whom we'll hear more later. In 1929-30, Bradman broke his own record of runs scored in a Sheffield Shield season. He made 894, including the then world record score in first-class cricket, of 452, not out. Do you think you had a different attitude to making big scores than cricketers who'd gone before? No, I don't think so. I think if you go through history, you'll find that uh, a lot of players, including even Victor Trapper, had made scores of 200-odd, 300-odd, and so on um, prior to that. And, of course, Ponsford, just before me, made two scores of over 400. I think the only man who's ever done that. Um, but one of the things that is uh, overlooked, usually, is that the time factor involved. It's the speed with which you score the runs that is a very important factor. Uh, the um, world's record score that I made, that 452, was made in a little over 400 minutes. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of people who batted for longer than that, but they didn't make as many runs because they didn't score at the same pace. His place in the Australian team to tour England in 1930 was assured. The, the film said getting accustomed to wet wickets. I don't know why wet wickets, because uh, uh, we were not batting on wet wickets, we were batting on perfectly normal English pitches. That's my little friend Archie Jackson there. And Stan McCabe. He seems more comfortable today. Nice legs, both that. Some of the English critics said that because Bradman played across the line of the ball and scored many of his runs with the pull shot, he wouldn't succeed on the softer English pitches. In the first test, he made 8 and 131. In the second, 254 and 1. England have never won a test on this ground yet. But it doesn't look like they're going to win this one the way Bradman is batting. Every time he scores something, hardly a ball gone in this over that he hasn't scored from. Bradman's 199. That's his 200. Well done. In the third game, he made the then world record score in tests. 334 runs, 309 of them in one day. They're all surrounding him and patting him on the back. This is the scene of the final test match played at the Oval. Bradman is batting to Hammond now. That gives Australia 300 runs on the board, with only three wickets down. Peebles is bowling to Bradman. That gives Bradman 99. Bradman's batting to Larwood. That gives him his century. He went on to make 232 in the fifth test and a total of 974 runs in the series at an average of 139.14. I think it was generally thought that we would lose the 1930 series but I believe our players got used to the conditions quickly and we improved rapidly as the tour went on. Uh, conversely, England had lost some of the older players who had been out here in 28-9, uh, had to bring in some fresh blood, and uh, before the tour was over, we were distinctly the better side. The test cricketers were the sporting superstars of the day. Bradman was filmed returning to his parents' home in Barrel. Some of the players who had toured England in 1930, 
featured in one of the first talking films ever made in Australia. And now let us see the Prince of Batsmen in action. Don Bradman, just come to man's estate and already known as the most phenomenal run-getting machine the world has ever seen. Here's a bird's eye view of the great batsman in action, the slow motion camera giving you every detail of his movements. In addition to being the world's greatest batsman, is a remarkable fieldsman, like a flash and bang goes the wicket. Against the West Indies in the summer of 1930-31, he averaged 74.5, and the next season he averaged 201.5, with two double centuries against South Africa. Jesse and I, as I said, came to school through here every day, she didn't know it. I think I was then, not sure whether it was 11 or 12, but I decided to marry her. <laughs> I didn't ask her. <laughs> I didn't ask her, I was too shy. But eventually I got around to it after about another 10 years. And so formed the best partnership of my life. Um. And you had an unusual honeymoon. <laughs> well, well, that was uh, accidental in a way. Arthur Maley had uh, tried to arrange a tour of Canada in the United States of America, and uh, I wasn't anxious to go, but on the other hand, Arthur said to me, now look, this tour is totally conditional upon your coming and being a member of the party. If you don't play, the tour is off. And so uh, uh, this really put me on a bit of a spot, you see, so I, I consulted with my employers and they said that that was all right, they'd give me the time off uh, to go if I wanted to go. And of course it would be a wonderful opportunity to see Canada and the USA and uh, an opportunity also for my wife as well to, to be in the party and have a good holiday. So in the end, I decided to uh, to go on the trip, and I, I never regretted it. It was a, a very enjoyable, very exciting period. The summer of 1932-33 brought the first real setbacks of Don Bradman's career. First, his employment contract was threatened because it breached the cricket board's rules on players writing about the game. That placed me in an, a totally untenable position that I had never anticipated. But I immediately said, well, come what may, I am going to honour my contract. Even if it means my retirement from cricket altogether, I can't play, I'm going to honour my contract. Uh, and that was the position and that would have stood, except that the, the newspaper concern found itself also in a very difficult situation, in that if they made me adhere to that contract, or if I did adhere to that contract, they would then be held responsible for putting me out of test cricket. I wouldn't play for Australia. So in the end, they came along to me and said, look, we, we want you to play for Australia, we prefer you to play for Australia, instead of writing uh, this test series. Bradman's supremacy on the cricket field was challenged too, by the body line tactics devised by England's captain, Douglas Jardine, and spearheaded by Harold Larwood, the fastest of the four pace bowlers in the England team. Jardine's dislike of Australians went back to 1921, when the touring Australian team had stopped him from getting a century for Oxford University by keeping him away from the strike. In 1932-33, Jardine packed most of his fieldsmen on the leg side and instructed his fast bowlers to bowl bounces at the batsman's body. Body line was devised to curb Bradman's dominance. They didn't bowl at all the time, but when they did, it was devastating. It was also, by any normal standards of sportsmanship, unthinkable. We were very upset, of course, with the tactics they were using, and there was no way that uh, we would have retaliated. Our, our skipper, Bill Woodfull, would never have used those tactics under any circumstances, any more than Gubby Allen would on the English side. He refused to bowl them. Um, the, um, the difficulty was how you're going to counteract them, you see, with, uh, with seven fieldsmen on the leg side, 
plus the wicketkeeper, plus the bowler, that makes nine fillers. You've only got two men on the offside, and the ball is being directed towards your body. There is virtually nowhere to go. There's nothing you can do. If you play defensively, you get caught by one of the short legs close up. If you play the hook shot, you get caught by somebody out on the fence. And, of course, there was also a very real danger, a physical danger, to the uh, players who were not very fast or very fleet of foot. Um, we, uh, we were upset about what they did. That showed you very clearly the direction of the ball. You see, uh, I'm standing on the leg side. Now, I move over to the offside. If I had stood exactly where I was, that ball would have hit me in the chest. This one, I'm afraid, a little bit higher than the chest. And this was a very emotional match because, you see, I'd not played in the first test, uh, test match due to illness. And I had come back into this second game and I think everybody was expecting that I might put up a good performance. Anyhow, uh, as I went out to bat, I, I seemed to have a premonition that Bill Bowes was going to bowl me a bumper. So I set myself to play the shot, and sure enough, he, he bowled it exactly where I expected he would, and I played the shot as I intended to play, but by a miracle, pulled it down from about chest high onto the base of my leg stump. I could try it a thousand times again, and I couldn't do it. But that was the end of it. Bradman scored 103 not out in the second innings of that second test. It was his only century of the series. His average was 56.57. England won back the Ashes in the fourth test, played in Brisbane. The team fourth test match in which England recaptured the Ashes is laid at Brisbane. Here in Queensland is really semi-tropical country and the sun blazes down from the cloudless sky like a molten ball of fire on this, the hottest day of the tour. Australia's first wicket stand ended at 133 with Richardson's departure, and Bradman appears. He is not very comfortable against Larwood, but he knocks up a useful 76 before being dismissed. It was obvious that uh, it was something that was not going to last. It only had a limited life before it stopped. And um, we were all very relieved, I think, when the season was over and we got back to normal cricket again. Did you get to know Douglas Jardine later in life? <laughs> not very well. Um, the nearest I got to him was that uh, after my career was finished, I did a tour of England as a journalist and consequently was in the press box each day writing my stuff for the newspaper. And so happened that Jardine was seated next to me in the press box. And uh, obviously we would have to say good morning to one another when we arrived, but there wasn't very much conversation during the day. We would occasionally have a, an argument about what happened on the field. He would say one thing and I would say something else. But that, that really was the only contact I had with him socially. In general, uh, in those days, did the members of opposing teams see a reasonable amount of each other off the field and become good friends? Yes, yes, they did very much indeed, with the exception of this 1932-3 tour. That was one of the, the tragedies of the whole thing, that it, it set up an enmity between the players and uh, you didn't have this fraternisation off the field that you would normally have. As a contrast to McCormick, the slow left-hander Fleetwood Smith comes on to bowl to Bradman, who in previous matches has scored many runs off the Victorian bowler. Commencing uh, this is the, uh, the match between New South Wales and Victoria at the Sydney Crew Ground in 1934. I had a bit of a field day on that occasion because uh, I uh, took the long handle to Fleetwood Smith and uh, <laughs> if my memory doesn't play me false, I think I hit five sixes in that innings. Whereas, uh, whereas I'd never hit a, f a six before in a first-class match. Uh, that was when I, uh, I was having a go towards the finish, and uh, 
I was trying to get out, as a matter of fact, and I hit a very easy catch to somebody in the outfield and he dropped me, so I had to repeat it all over again. Got caught the next time. You see, it's perfectly obvious is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get out. And I made sure that Fleetwood Smith got my wicket. I was always concerned and I did not want to lead the life of a professional cricketer dependent on cricket for a living. I wanted to get some uh, business career of my own that was outside sport. And uh, Mr. Hodgett, who was a member of the Australian Cricket Board and, and uh, a leading figure in the South Australian Cricket Association, approached me and said if I came to Adelaide, he would give me a contract which would guarantee me a position with his firm for six years, would allow me time off to play cricket, and would teach me the business of stock and share market. Now, this was an offer that was too good to refuse. Uh, I didn't understand the business of stock and share broking at the time, but I was always interested in figures, mathematics, and, and so on. It appealed to me very much, and uh, so I, I signed a contract with him, and that was that. Before we left Australia in 1934, I uh, was examined, of course, by the board doctor, and I was passed by him as fit to go on the tour. But I was not well. I couldn't tell you what was the matter with me. I just felt off colour. I used to get very bad headaches. And I felt there was some doubt as to whether I was well enough to go on the tour. And I was still very unwell when I got to England, and I was still very off colour in the early matches of the tour. I knew I wasn't right, but nobody could find out what was the matter with me. Bradman's health seemed to improve for a time and he found his form in the fourth test where he scored a triple century, again at Leeds, and with Bill Ponsford put on 388 in a record fourth wicket partnership. In the fifth test, Bradman made 244 and Ponsford 266. Their partnership of 451 was the highest ever made in test cricket. To the Oval come all those thousands who intend to see the destination of the Ashes decided in the fifth and final match, the timeless test. Ponsford, the hero of many a match, reaches his fifth test century. Not long afterwards, the crowd is cheering Bradman for his hundred. single is nearly too quick for Ponsford. Don has now overhauled his partner and gets his 200. Then Ponsford. Still together, they set up the world's record partnership for any wicket beating Hobbs and Rhodes stand of 323 at Melbourne in 1912. The diagnosis was that I had appendicitis and uh, it turned into peritonitis. And in those days you didn't have penicillin, you didn't have the modern antibiotics and it was a very serious business and uh, I was actually in hospital for uh, five weeks. Is it true that Lady Bradman heard that you'd died? Uh, she had to go by train to Melbourne and then from Melbourne across to Perth to pick up the boat. And it was when she was in Melbourne that she heard this rumour that I had died. And um, she's uh, a woman with a rather optimistic view of life and she refused to believe it. And so she said, well, I want to ring the hospital and find out. And they, they rang the hospital straight away and she spoke to the doctor. And, uh, of course, I wasn't dead, I was still alive, and so she went on with the voyage. Mrs. Bradman, followed by Don, leaves her hotel en route to catch the boat train at Victoria on their way back to Australia. 
It will be remembered that Mrs. Bradman rushed to England when her husband's health gave cause for anxiety after his operation for appendicitis. Now he is fit and cheery once more, but inclined to be reticent when questioned as to how soon he expects to be playing cricket again. Uh, I was in such a run-down condition at that stage uh, that um, the doctors refused to give me uh, all clear to go to South Africa in 1935-6, so I missed an international tour which didn't take place for nearly 12 months afterwards. England, led by Gubby Allen, toured Australia in 1936-37. His illness behind him, Don Bradman took over the Australian captaincy. I was a, a most inexperienced captain and it wasn't an easy job. But uh, you've got to take time to, to get into these things and find your feet. This was always a great point of contention between Gubby Allen and me. The first test in Brisbane, we had to get a score of, I think it was between three and four hundred on the last day to win the match. But it rained and of course we got caught on the stick of wicket and we lost the match. Now I say that we would have got the runs if it hadn't rained. Alan said we had no chance of getting the runs and they would have won it anyway. But for sure we lost the match because it rained, there was no argument about that. Then in the second test in Sydney, England won the toss and made a very big score. There was no way we were ever going to win the match from that stage on. But again, it rained. We got caught on the sticky wicket again. And we lost because of the rain. I, I said we couldn't have won the match, but at least I think we could have saved it. We could have made a draw. But because of the rain, we were two down. Bradman had lost his first two tests as captain. There was talk of disloyalty in the Australian team. Questions were asked about his leadership. He answered them with scores of 270, 212 and 169 in the last three tests of the series. We won the third test because the rain came and favoured us. We got the benefit of it. The Adelaide match was the only one played which was not interfered with by rain. It was a very close, very exciting affair. We won it. And we got to the fifth test match, all square. Melbourne, and the fifth test opens with Bradman and Alan Fossing, and Bradman wins for the third consecutive time. Don's happy smile was reflected on every Australian's face. Hammond to Bradman, a single, and Don reaches the hundred, equaling Hobbs' record of 12 test centuries in the England-Australia series. Almost 80,000 people hail the champion. Alan to Badcock, and a thrill. The English skipper misses a catch off his own bowling, his third offence in the match. Barnes bowls Sleepwood Smith, and Australia has totaled 604. The English openers, Barnett and Wellington. Nash to Barnett, watch Oldfield. A beautiful catch, and is out. Sleepwood Smith almost embraces Oldfield with delight. Fleetwood Smith to Hardstaff, who is unfortunate in missing his century. And now Fleetwood Smith to Hammond. Even this champion couldn't stop the drift. Hopes crash as Allen goes. Caught by wicketkeeper Oldfield, off net. And now Oldfield again. He stumps both off a typically guileful ball from O'Reilly. It can't be long now, and it won't. With the tail enders figuring in the quickest of collapses. There's one gone. And another. Two balls, two wickets. England's beaten by an innings and plenty. In the final analysis, I say we lost two matches because of the rain. We won two matches because of the rain. And the fifth one, uh, which was played in Adelaide uh, without any rain, we won that on our merits. So I think the final result was a fair uh, uh, judgment on the capacity of the two sides. 38 uh, was a difficult tour. Uh, I felt that our, uh, our bowling was not as strong as it had been on some previous occasions. And I felt that I had a very great responsibility as captain of the team. And I had to work very hard to try and uh, 
hold us together uh, in a few matches. Um, I, I would say that that was uh, probably the most difficult of the four tours that I had in England. Um, we got out of it in the end with, a, with an honourable draw, but uh, we were not a, a tremendously powerful side. Australia had only two reliable bowlers, McCormick and the great Bill O'Reilly. England, with the newcomers Edrich, Compton and Len Hutton, had a very strong batting side. They made 658 in the first innings of the first test. Australia had no option but to try to hold on for a draw. Right batting his fast leg breaks gives England an early success, but there's Bradman to reckon with, and Don goes all out to put runs on the board. He puts 50 to his own name. The feature of the game, from Australia's point of view, was Stan McCabe's brilliant double century. That's uh, Stan McCabe. It was the greatest innings that I ever saw anyone play, and I don't think it would be possible for anybody to play better than Stan played that particular innings. Um, at one stage, I was up in the Australian dressing room, and I called out to some of the boys who were in the back of the room to come and have a look at it, because I said, you'll never see anything like this again. Um, he, uh, he and Fleetwood Smith put on 77 runs for the last week, and it, I think it was 25 minutes. And the Englishman had five men on the boundary all that time and were trying to deprive him of the strike. In Australia's second innings, Bradman made a patient 144. He was concentrating on defence, but watch his footwork. no earthly chance of us winning the match and when we came to bat in the second innings I said to the boys now we can't possibly let Stan, Stan McCabe down we can't win this match but we have got to save it and so we did fortunately we, we made a draw out of it. During the second test played at Lords the Australian players were presented to King George VI. This game was drawn too and the third test was washed out without a ball being bowled. Australia won by five wickets at Leeds and were one up with only one test to play. In the final test at the Oval, England won the toss and batted first. Of all the records broken in this test, one excites the Oval crowd most, the beating of Bradman's highest ever test score. Here's a historic stroke that does it. Bradman is first to congratulate Hutton. Bradman, trying everything, puts himself on to bowl. Give a little bit of relief to our bowlers, I decided to bowl a few overs myself. Uh, because the ground was soft, big holes had been dug where the bowlers' feet had been landing. Then, as if Australia weren't in trouble already, Bradman has to be carried off the field by White and Fleetwood Smith. Bradman out of the test, and Fingleton, and that's England's total. I put my foot on the edge of one of these holes and went over on my ankle and uh, chipped a bone in the ankle and had to go off and, and I didn't play again on the whole tour. He was 30 years old. It would be eight years before he played in another test match. He had a successful Sheffield Shield season, including six centuries in a row in 1938-39, but by the time he resumed after the Second World War, his best years as a batsman were behind him. There's no simple secret to a success like Don Bradman's. Hours and hours of practice are one essential, but success comes from a combination of all the skills. He thought and moved very quickly. His coordination was superb. His judgment of what he could do was almost perfect. He made a huge number of runs with the pull shot. It's not the most attractive shot in cricket, but it's one of the most effective when it's well played. Bradman perfected. If the ball was short, most of the time it was bang, four runs. But he had all the other shots too, and when people who know cricket see film of him, the shots that make them sigh with envy are the deflections. 
the leg glances and the late cuts. Above all, perhaps, and this is what the people who played with him say about him, he had a supreme confidence in his ability to see and judge things for what they are. I didn't let the mental side of it worry me. I, I always had confidence in my own ability. Um, if I um, made a mistake, uh, I felt that I, nine times out of ten it was a physical mistake that I had tried to do something and I didn't get there in time. I was too slow or something like that. But I'm sure with a, a lot of players, their mental attitude is terribly important. They, they imagine there are difficulties that uh, are not really there. Don and Jesse Bradman's son John was born in 1939 and their daughter Shirley was born in 1941. To add to his responsibilities, Bradman's employer, Harry Hodgetts, went broke in 1945 and Bradman set up his own business as a stockbroker in Adelaide. At that time, I honestly did not think that I would play first-class cricket again. But uh, you, you want to cast your mind back to the uh, euphoria that existed in the community with the end of the war. Uh, and uh, particularly in England, they were very, very anxious to get cricket started again, to give them some relief from the conditions that they'd endured for several years. So there was tremendous pressure on the sporting authorities to get uh, cricket in particular going again. And that was really why England agreed to come out to Australia in 46, 47, even though uh, the authorities, I think, felt it was probably a little bit early and they were not quite ready for it. They still saw the necessity to get cricket started for the sake of the public. We, of course, agreed to meet them, and then I personally was under very great pressure to play, and uh, it was with a great deal of reluctance that I consented, and I said, well, I'll try, and I'll, I'll see how I, how I perform. And I think I had a, a good piece of luck in the first test match. I might have been out fairly early, but... Uh, managed to go on and make a century. I didn't think I was ever 100% in He scored his 100th century in first-class cricket in the summer of 1947-48 against the first Indian team ever to come to Australia. Then came his last test series and his last tour to England in 1948. I can recall that we had a team meeting in Perth before we left Australia and uh, I gave the boys a bit of a pep talk over there and <laughs> told them I, I had great confidence in the side. I thought we had great strength, great depth and uh, that we could more than match the opposition. Uh, I didn't uh, really think at that stage we were going to be good enough to go through the tour undefeated, but I think I gradually instilled into them enough confidence to make them realise that this was possible. And as the tour unfolded, they began to realise uh, themselves how good the team was. I was going out of the game and I wanted to go out on a high note, both for myself and for my players and for the country. So I, I went to great lengths to try and make sure that everything was all right. The Duke of Edinburgh graced the cricket writer's dinner in London where he met Don Bradman. I was in England for two weeks and hadn't been to bed before one o'clock in the morning, which gives you an idea that I was working pretty hard. And as the tour went on and as we were very successful, our mail increased enormously. I got to the stage uh, at one point where my own personal mail reached 600 letters a day. Every road led to Trent Bridge. Skies threatened, but the lure of the first test match prevailed until the ground was full, the turnstiles clicked without interruption. No money was wanted back by 26,000 cricket fans. On a batsman's pitch, England were all out 165. Deplorable, but better than seemed likely. Edwidge opened to Barnes in the last quarter of an hour of the day. Betts are bowled at the other end to Morris. The batsmen put on 73 before Laker bowled Morris next morning, and the monarch of all batsmen came to the wicket for the last test match here at Trent Bridge. 
Australians looking on saw the captain weather a rather shaky start and slowly, too slowly for the liking of the crowd, the score mounted till by a boundary off Edridge, Bradman sent up the hundred. With Hassett's partner, Bradman got his century after nearly four hours at the wicket with a boundary off Betzer. It was the great man's 18th test match hundred against England. There was tremendous applause as he came in at the close of play. The Headingley ground was packed for the fourth test, in spite of the fact that the question of the Ashes was already settled. England took the field after scoring 496, and early successes rewarded our bowlers. Here's Hassett, caught crap, bowled Pollard 13. And Bradman, clean bowl by Pollard for 33. But Australia's youngest player, Harvey, came to the rescue. Not only was he playing in his first test over here at the age of 19, he also made a century. Australia needed 404 runs to win in less than a day. A 301 run partnership between Morris and Bradman won the match for Australia with 12 minutes to spare. Linwell, 6 for 20, bowls Young for naught. England's record low total was naturally a sensation, but it was not the only surprise of the match. We might have had a second innings. And so I, I was not aware that it was going to be my last innings. Uh, neither was I aware at that stage that I only wanted four runs to have a test match average of 100. And uh, it was a pretty emotional occasion because Yardley called all his fieldsmen around and they all gave me three cheers before I took block. Enter Don Bradman, who got a great ovation. <laughs> then a special cheer on the field. Well, it isn't often you get a big hand when you make a duck, but this was different. I was a trifle unlucky in, in the sense that I played at the ball and actually hit it on the inside edge of the bat and pulled it onto the stumps. Um, but I think if I'd taken a, a little bit more care, I might have got away with it. But that's one of the things that happens in the game of cricket. On that dull Wednesday morning, the incomparable Don Bradman came out of the Oval for the last time as captain in a test match. Then came quickly. Eric Hollis had a go at one from Johnston and was caught by Morris. England were beaten by an innings and 149 runs. Yes, it was a sad story for England, but there were very bright scenes at the Oval where everything was forgotten for the moment except the importance of paying tribute to Don Bradman. It must have been almost embarrassing for that great cricketer, but it must have been a very happy moment too. Yardley, who was described Don as the greatest cricketer of all time, called on the crowd to give him three special cheers, which they did with a will. There comes a time in every man's life, irrespective of whether he may still be good enough to carry on or not, that he should make way for a younger man. I feel that in my own case, and I think I'm probably the best judge of the many little creaks and groans that go on in my joints throughout the day, uh, especially when we're out in the field and I'm quite sure I shall have no regrets at all in having to sit in the pavilion and watch the other fellows. However, I do trust that in some other capacity I may be able to serve this wonderful game for many years to come. Farewell to the stage on which he'd been the star for 20 years. Back home, back to his family, to John and Shirley and his wife.
it was a bit sad to say, well, that's the end of my career as a player. And at that time, I never had any intention at all of playing another cricket match. The fact that I did play again was uh, brought about because they uh, very kindly agreed to play a testimonial match for me in Melbourne. <laughs> It was his last appearance on the Melbourne cricket ground. He played in a Sheffield Shield match and in two more testimonial games for other players. Then, the Don's career on the field was finished. I stayed on the Australian Cricket Board for a very long time, I think some of the order of 30 odd years. And I was chairman for two, three year periods. I served on the committees of the South Australian Cricket Association for goodness knows how many years. And uh, I think I served on the Australian Selection Committee for a total of about 35 years. So I think they were pretty reasonable contributions to the uh, administration of the game and, and that's the sort of thing I meant when I said I could serve the game in other capacities. Does cricket still keep you busy these days? No, no, not now because I, I have no longer any connection with it at all. I'm not on any committee uh, and uh, although I still go and have a look at the matches occasionally and I have a great interest in it and watch it both on television and at the ground sometime, I'm not obligated to do so, and in a sense it's a great relief that you haven't got to go. You, you go when you feel like it. Do you still get a lot of mail on it? Oh yes, I, I, that, that is absolutely astounding. I would think that, apart from the 48 tour of England, which I mentioned before, when the mail was absolutely horrendous, I would honestly think that I get just as much mail today as I ever got in my life, and it is quite common me to have to spend three or four hours a day just dealing with the mail. If you could pick a moment to live over again, what would it be? Oh, well, uh, I, uh, I don't think I want to talk about uh, my private life. Uh, there might have been a lot of moments in my private life that I remember with great pleasure, but I think on the cricket field, um, probably the uh, the most exhilarating time was when we won that test match at Leeds and we scored over 400 in the last innings uh, on, on a worn wicket, which was a performance that no team in history had ever accomplished before. That, of course, sealed the ashes for us on that 48 tour. There are many times that uh, in your career you play a good innings, which gives you great pleasure at the time. For instance, that one when I played against Fleetwood Smith in Sydney, but uh, that's rather different because that's really a, a personal satisfaction to achieve something, whereas what I'm talking about was an achievement for your team and your country to win the Ashes. Uh, but of course there are many very exhilarating moments that, that you think of very often in the middle of the night when you can't go to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Sir. Thank you.